Hey folks, thanks for joining me here for week two of Flower Farming Business, Starting, Sustaining, and Surviving. I'm Lisa Mason Ziegler. And tonight I am gonna be sharing, well the whole series is really about sharing the um, backside of flower farming, the part that a lot of people just don't know about if they're not doing it yet. But tonight I'm gonna be answering some of these questions. And these are the questions that we hear over and over. Is now the right time to jump into this? I've never started or owned a business before, can I do it? And how much, this is probably one of the most common ones I hear, how much space do I have to have to start? And do you really have to have a tractor or a greenhouse? And the other one that's always asked, who can I sell my flowers to? So those are all the things that I'm gonna be chatting about tonight. Um, hope you'll stick around with me. And this four week series is brought to you by thegardenersworkshop.com where we are just huge believers that flower lovers at all levels should be able to grow and enjoy flowers and to even build businesses based on flowers. And, you know, I invite you, if you're not already, to like my Facebook page. You're actually on my farm Facebook page right now. And I appreciate it if you'd like it. And if you are over on Instagram, I am too. So I'd love for you to follow me there. And I even have a YouTube channel. So there's just a lot of ways that we can connect with one another. And um, I look forward to that. So I want to introduce myself for those folks that, you know, maybe we haven't met before, right? Um, so just pretty briefly, my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler. And um, I was a gardener 23 years ago that found a book called The Flower Farmer and knew I'd found my dream and literally just went after it. And um, so I am in the middle of the city. I'm in southeastern Virginia. And when I first started, our whole property was only an acre and a quarter. Well, actually a little less than that. And my home and some outbuildings were on that too. So when I first started, I only had two quarter acre gardens. And I was like that for like the first 12 years. And so because I'm in the middle of the city, I really can't have hoop and greenhouses. So everything I do is out in the field and I start seeds in a grow room. And so kind of life kind of progressed. I was incredibly embraced by the local trade here and customers and built my business. And of course, I've kind of spread it out into several different areas now. Um, but the bottom line is I am a non-farmer growing in the middle of the city. I didn't have a tractor or a greenhouse or much space. Um, I still don't have a greenhouse, but I didn't get my first tractor until I'd been in it for 12 years. And um, here I am, I love what I do and um, love sharing that with other folks. And that's what these lives are all about, right? Um, because I often get asked, and y'all I've got a stack of papers in front of me trying to help keep me on point. Um, I'm often asked, why do I, you know, share so much information and especially information about flower farming? People feel like I'm equipping my competition. Well, first off, if this was that easy, a ton of people would be doing it. Um, and I don't believe that that's true. First off, I embrace the competition. I think together as a whole, pull, us all pulling together is better for us, it's better for the industry, and it's better for the end customer. But the bottom line is I am really naturally compelled um, to encourage and to share and teach. I feel really, really drawn to that. But I'll tell you another reason. And what you have to understand is when I started farming, this is gonna age me, y'all. When I started farming 22 or 23 years ago, you know, we didn't have social media. We barely had the internet. Um, and you basically learned from books and going to conferences and, you know, you were lucky if you had a flower farmer within an hour of you, right? Well, so you just kind of had to figure it out and do it. Well, today there are so many choices, so many ideas, and so many voices, and unfortunately, so many opinions in place of people 
with actual experience. Um, I think it's because of all of those things, it's so easy to get the wrong information and be misguided. I think it's harder to be successful today than it was when I started 20 years ago. And I mean, if you really stop and think about it, we were really starting blindfolded, you know? I mean, I had a book, I had some, um, go, uh, the um, Cut Flower Quarterly from the Cut Flower Association, but really you were kind of on your own. And um, so I'm just reading over my notes here. Um, so all the information that's out there really, really creates almost a fog so you kind of like can't even see what you're supposed to, the, the right way to go. So, you know, I'm answering, this whole series is about me answering the questions that we hear over and over. Um, it's not that I'm the right answer, but I will tell you that my answers are based on 22 years of flower farming successfully as a business person and as a flower farmer. And so I invite you to join me every Sunday night in September. And whether you're just starting out or perhaps you've been at it for a few years, but the day-to-day -day is taking you over um, and just gobbling you up or you're not making any money, you know, what's the point if you're not making money, y'all? I mean, you, the love of the flowers gets old really quick to your family, you know, at the end of the season and, you know, you spent more money than you made and there are more people in that boat than you would imagine. So, I have several things I want to talk about tonight, um, and I've also, I did put a link at the head of this feed, and it'll be under this video for folks that are watching it later, to get, the link will sign you up for our email, but you will immediately get four resources. One of them's mine, is the tired and ready to quit video, then there's a resource from Dave Dowling, Farm Hacks, which is amazing. I learned three things when I got it. Jenny Love's video series about, I don't remember the exact name, but it's about how the farmer florists have pivoted their business in the face of COVID and events being canceled. It's an amazing four, 15 minute each, I think, videos. And the third one is Ellen Frost. Um, hers is collabs that crush and she's talking about collaboration with flower farmers and student and designers so you can sign up to get those you'll get them immediately and i highly recommend them because they are great great resources so the very first thing that i want to talk about is is now the right time to start any business really um, but really a flower farming or a flower related business and I can tell you wholeheartedly that I think there are more opportunities now than there have ever been for local flower farmers. Because if you're not in the industry, um, you may not have seen this. You may have seen some of the videos that got viral amongst you know the gardening and flower people about how um, the countries that import to us were burning millions of dollars of flowers when the pandemic broke out. And that's all true. And it was sad. It was very, very sad. But in fact, what happened, because all of those chains were broken, there were no imports available, but people were still demanding and wanting flowers. For about a week, there was no demand, but then it was right back on the track again. And guess what, y'all? the local flower farmers were like the only gig in town. So it's really opened the eyes of tons of designers and flower shops and wholesalers that before the pandemic might not have given a little cut flower farmer the time of day. That has all changed now. Um, Jenny Love posted, um, so today is September 14th or 15th to give you a reference of 2020 for people watching this later. Jenny Love posted on her Instagram TV, Love and Fresh Flowers last night, an excellent, about a 10 minute long talk about how for farmer florist, there are more opportunities to get started now than there has ever been. So to answer your question of is now the time to start, I say beyond a shadow of a doubt, now is an excellent time to start. 
um, a flower farming, a farmer florist, a design studio. Um, and if you listen to Jenny's talk, you'll learn all about how that is. So the other thing, and I totally understand this, is people express about going into business, whether it's flower farming or otherwise, that they're afraid. And I understand. It is frightening. But here's the thing, y'all. Being in business, you're going to be a little scared. You should be a little scared every single day. Because that means you're stepping out of your box. And that's what it takes to be a business leader. And I mean, even if you're a one-man show, because what ha what scares you? You know, people get scared of spending money. They get scared of saying to a florist, yes, I can provide you with a standing order of $500 a week, thinking, oh my gosh, can I grow that many flowers? <laughs> you know, I get it. But that's what it takes. I mean, my daddy used to say, You've got your neck stretched out on the block, don't you? <laughs> and it was you, and as soon as you master that, you do it for something else. That's how you keep a business moving. It is perfectly normal and is the right feeling to have to be afraid. And if I don't, I mean, I was afraid earlier today. I mean, I, it, it just doesn't change. You don't ever get past that. That's just a part of being in business. And it's not so much being afraid. It's a it's like being a little uncomfortable, not feeling so, can I do that? Challenged. Um, and those are all perfectly normal feelings, guys. Um, you know, and that's really part of taking that step of being an entrepreneur. Um, on people that particularly flower farming people, y'all, we're a very unique group. We're totally over ambitious. And I think that most of us would be what the rest of the world would say are cliff jumpers. I mean, we deal with weather. We, I mean, I farm out, out in the field. I don't have any houses. I totally am at the, at the mercy of the weather. You know, I'm not talking about irrigating and drought. I'm talking about wind and storms and um, and crazy things like that, right? So, we are a gutsy group of people. And don't let thinking that we're so gutsy that we don't have those feelings. I'm here to tell you that I'm afraid just about every day. Every day I go, huh! you know, get that little turn in my gut. Get a little, you know, and it really is so helpful to be with other people in groups, in whether it's in a Facebook group or in a networking group that are facing what you're facing, those people there to encourage you. I mean, of course, your family. Your family has to be on board with this um, because you really, that would be a really difficult task to, to overcome that. But being afraid is exactly what you should be feeling. So the other one I have um, is I've, that I get asked and has been emailed over and over is I've never owned a business before and they are very, very intimidated. And that kind of is kind of in that same department of being a little afraid, but it shouldn't be because going the act, once you decide you're going to do it, there are certainly some certain steps you need to take. And in my flower farming course, flower farming school, the basics, that's what the whole first week is, is about the business, about getting your business in order, getting things figured out, what you should have, who you should talk to, and get it done and file it away. Because I tell you what a lot of people do, and I, I, can, I can think of speaking to a couple of people. They're like, oh no, I never did anything about that. I'll just wait and see if anything happens. You cannot run a business like that, y'all. That's the kind of stuff that you might not realize it, but it keeps you awake at night. Um, and you just really do not need to do that. Because once you have your walk-in papers of what to do, you just go and do it, face it, and get it over with. Um, I've just faced it a whole, I've just faced a whole new line of challenges in that department um, in moving my business, the warehouse. And, you know, I understand that it's scary and you're afraid of how much it's gonna cost and all of those things, but those are necessary steps. 
And the really important thing is, is that you get with people that you can get sound advice changes everything. I can't really overemphasize that enough. So the other one is, do I have time to do this? Well, I think people assume they have time to do it. I guess I'm the one asking you, do you have time? I will tell you that when I first started flower farming, I was working pretty much full time at my husband's business, helping them out. I actually had quit working at the um, animal hospital I worked at for 15 years as a business manager to help him in his business. And I was working and I will tell you, because my business really took off from the get-go, because I was there was no other flower farmers in our region, I was quickly overwhelmed. But one of the things that I suggest that people do is, you know, if you decide that you want to do this, you got to make, I'm a list person, y'all. We, we, if you watch the tired and ready to quit video that is in the free resource you can get, if you haven't watched it, you can. I have you make a couple of lists. Making lists and writing them down instead of putting them on your phone or on a tablet or on a computer helps so much. And you need to really sit down and say, okay, how much time do I have five days a week to give to this endeavor? Because y'all, it takes time. Um, it takes time to garden, to build your farm, to get your gardens going. You have to sell, you have to find customers. Um, I'm not saying it's impossible, but I'm saying it does take time. So you need to figure out, because that'll really dictate what type of market you are interested in, what market you could do. Let's just say you've got a young family, you've got three kids under seven. Um, being a farmer florist may not be in the cards for you right now, because guess what? They work weekends. That's when events typically are. That may not work out really well for you with kids that have a lot of activities on the weekend. But this is one of the things that we talk about so much. My method and my suggestion to people is almost all the people that we think of when we think of successful flower farmers, whether no matter what they're doing now, that have built their businesses in different ways, they all started with the foundation of being a good flower farmer. And now may be your time to do that. And you can build on that later if you're not in a position to quit your job. Do you have a young family? Those children will grow up and you will have more time ultimately. So things change. So you have to consider how much time do you really have? And the um, question that is, and my answer is so surprising to so many people is, do I have enough space? Well, you have to know that I know people that started on less than an eighth of an acre and turned a good profit the very first year. Um, Jenny Love, I think, started on even less than an eighth of an acre. She was like at a community garden and did um, a farmer's market for a year or two and then started doing weddings from there before she actually got her own space somewhere that was a little bit bigger. I think that... People underestimate when you plant the right stuff, manage it properly, harvest it properly, you will be totally blown away by how much a small space produces. And in fact, what kills the career of most flower farmers that have more space available to them is they overplant. They plant way too big. They couldn't possibly ever take care of it, much less cut it, and then who are they going to sell it to? Because they have no time to do that. It's like a vicious cycle. I think because I was forced to start so small, as I mentioned earlier, so I had two quarter-acre gardens. And I will tell you, back in the very beginning, a lot of them were, a lot of that was vegetables also. And then my flowers, as I got more successful and more time, the flowers kind of took it over. And the problem that happens when people overplant is then you can't take care you can't do anything very well you can't i mean it just beats you up chews you up and spits you out dead at the end of the day so i think the gift is for those people that can't have more than a quarter of an acre um so that the the highest income that i ever made per half an acre 
was when I only had two quarter acre gardens. And that's because I was so efficient. I was by myself then too. I was so efficient and I mean, I could get everything done. I was selling everything. I mean, it was just an excellent model. So I don't want people to think um, that, I mean, I know people that are growing literally in a backyard with not even an eighth of an acre and doing a subscription service or doing a farmer's market or doing whatever. Anything is possible when you manage it, plant it, and harvest. And I will tell you, if you're facing small spaces, don't even think about perennials and woodies. Um, that is not in your picture yet. It could be when you get more space. The biggest bang for your buck is annuals. I still grow 98% annuals um, because there's more money in it for me in my situation here. Um, and I just don't have a lot of space. I now have an acre and a half of garden that could be in production. Um, so a gift is being forced to start small. And do not feel penalized. Do not. I just read on social media somewhere somebody asked, so when do you really get to call yourself a flower farmer? And I really struggled with that myself. I totally understand that question. Um, I can remember speaking to a, I just met a cousin on Steve's side of the family. This was years ago. And they were actually a writer for Organic Gardening Magazine. If anybody remembers that magazine. It was years, it's no longer. And they said, oh my gosh, your story is so awesome. And I said, well, but I'm not really a farmer. It's like I was apologizing for making them think I was a farmer, but all I had was two quarter acre gardens. Y'all, the bottom line is that when you start growing with the intention to sell and you sell some flowers, you are a farmer, right? So get over the space thing. I'm telling you, you can do it. And I think you can actually do it better on a small space than you can on a large space. More farmers don't make it because they overplant. Tractor or greenhouse? I read about this a lot on fat, on, on um, social media too of people saying, oh, well, you, you have to have this and you should have this and you should have this and you should have that and you should have this. Y'all, I'm going to be totally and completely honest with you. I started farming with literally a wheelbarrow, shovel, a garden fork, an F 250 pickup truck that I bought a mismatched cap to go on, which we'll talk about that in a minute, and seeds. I mean, I read Lynn Bozinski's book, and I got seed started. The seed starting stuff is what I invested in. I, I did exactly what Elliot Coleman suggested with soil blocking. Got a heat mat, got my soil blocker, made his recipe, and was a success out of the gate. And I will tell you that I spent probably in today's money, I know I spent less than $300 the first year and made money. Yes, it's nice to have all those things, but my contention is, I mean, especially when I see people recommending buying certain things, it's like you don't even know if you need those certain things. And certain things aren't the same for everybody in all regions. Um, so it's really a bad hole to fall into. Um, I didn't get a tractor until year 10, 11 or 12, I think, and I still do not have a greenhouse. Um, so I know that's like the story of your parents talking about, you know, walking to school in the snow uphill with no shoes on, but it is literally true. If you really want to start and you don't have any bucks, you can do it. You can have a garage sale and make enough money, um, but you can, you know, and the other thing that I see people doing is investing in plants that might not be the right ones. I did that. Um, the second year in, I spent a lot of money buying a perennial that I, don't, I still don't remember why I bought it, but it was a dianthus and it was not a cutting dianthus. And I bought a boatload of it, which cost way more money than I had. And then I planted it and then it was so aggressive, I couldn't get it out of my garden. I mean, it was like Y'all, you got to get in and get started before you start spending money. And then I want to talk about delivery vehicle. So I just mentioned, so the first couple of years, um, I drove a big F-250 with a clutch. They could hear me coming two blocks away. I bought a cap. My daddy made a rack that went in the back. I could deliver, I think, 23 buckets in the back of that without them falling over, but I had to crawl up in the back of that truck. Of course, it was four-wheel drive, pretty tall. Not a good scene, but guess what? I sold some flowers out of that truck until the third year. That was the first thing I ever bought was I bought 
a new pickup truck with a good cab and use that same rack system that my dad made for me. So I'm saying all these things to encourage you. If you're trying to start, um, I think it's better to start with not a lot of options so you can figure things out and figure out what it is that you really, really need. And then who could you sell your flowers to? That's like the million dollar question, right? Um, and I think that people automatically think of farmer's markets and florists, both great markets, if there's room in that market for you. Um, but we have, there's a lot of other markets. I mean, when I say markets, I don't mean farmer's markets. I mean flower marketing, air places you can sell your flowers. Um, you know, I sold wholesale to florists for many years. I sell in two retail situations, not at farmer's markets. Now, after COVID, I think there's been more um, re direct to customer methods developed in the last seven months by flower farmers than any time in the history. I mean, I know I, I, know I keep missing, mentioning Jenny Love. It's because I watched her talk yesterday and I remember things that she said in her, her course, Farmer Florist School. And we all, many of us, have shied away from we, we know we're so busy growing the flowers that we're looking for the quickest and easiest way to sell our flowers. And thinking about dealing with a situation with retail models has always kind of been like, eh, I don't have time to do all that stuff. Like, we never did brides. We never did weddings. I don't even want to talk to a bride. Um, and we were, like, very firm about that. Well, we were also pretty firm about um, the way that we sold our flowers. And that is, I have two retail programs here on the farm that we had to totally revamp this year. They've been around for 20 years. We had to totally revamp them for COVID. And I see people like Janice Harris in Canada, um, who is an amazing flower farmer, who, another farmer florist, who had to flip her business to be able to sell the tens of thousands of tulips that she had coming in. Um, so there are a lot of ways to sell your flowers. Um, you know, I mean, beyond florists, there's wholesalers, there's supermarkets. Of course, there's, um, there, now there are so many shops that are taking, selling bouquets, health food stores. Um, and there's just a lot of different industries that we talk about that is beyond those obvious, I mean, I read a lot about people being discouraged. They're like, oh my gosh, I'm going to the farmer's market. And they're either in a market that has no traffic because of poor location or it's a new market, or worse yet, it's a market that is not a producer only market. That means that everything customers can know that that market manager polices the farmers and make sure that everything that's being sold there is being grown by those farmers. You cannot imagine how many people buy wholesale product and then bring it to a farmer's market and sell it. And it looks like they grow it. Um, that really kills a market. So I understand if you're sitting in a market with no foot traffic, but y'all, you have not, you've got to figure out what is available to you. What are your niches? I know people that drive two hours to go into big cities to get to flower shops or to go to a wholesaler or to have a wholesaler truck come to your farm and you don't, and yes, you make less money, but guess what? That means you have to have a vehicle. That means you haven't got to have vehicle insurance. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot of good and bad, and there's a lot of myths, and there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so I want to say to you that there are a lot of ways to sell flowers and to not be discouraged. And I am a true believer that there are more ways to sell flowers now than there ever was before. Um, the way that my sister has set up our members-only market, it's like, oh, my gosh, we're never going back to the old way. <laughs> I mean, it is... There's just, you have to just step out of your box. Um, so the other thing um, for me, um, that when I first started selling, I was right out of the gate, 
I will tell you that I was a success because of the first customer that I picked. That's another thing I see people kind of not really doing their homework. I really read what Lynn Bozinski's book, that flower farmer book, boy, just really, I did what she said. She said to find a shop that's going to know what to do with your flowers, meaning it's an upscale shop. People want more than carnations. They know what to do with more than carnations, right? And so I did that. And when I went into that shop, that floral designer immediately took me under his wing and he wanted me to be successful. But here's a mistake that I made. And he shared prices. With, that first year was like a dream come true. I mean, I was at home growing as much as I could because he would buy it all. He was showing me the wholesaler price list because I knew nothing back then. Not that I know that much more now, but you know. Um, but then my worst fear came and got me. The winter between my first and my second season, he left that shop. And I had pretty much put all my eggs into one basket. And before I learned that, I had actually started plotting to go to another city that's Williamsburg, which a lot of people may know, Colonial Williamsburg. It's like 25 minutes from me. I had already planned to go to Williamsburg. And when I found out that he had left that shop, I knew that that's what I had to do. But I learned a really good lesson that day. First off, I think that experience drove me to be so diversified. I will tell you that we st I started out wholesaling to florist. Then I went to the Williamsburg Farmer's Market. I started there in year three. Then I introduced um, the Garden Share, which is our members only on farm market. And then I also introduced this um, bouquet subscription. And then we picked up supermarkets. Over the years, these things happen. Because I think I felt compelled to have my fingers in different areas after that experience with that first floor. So I can't tell you how scared I was. I mean, I was growing a lot of flowers and I thought, oh my gosh, the guy that bought everything that I grew last year is no longer at a flower shop. Um, so diversifying and there are a lot of ways and, um, probably the biggest myth that I busted was that I was too small a grower to sell to supermarkets. We overcame that. Um, so there is a lot of opportunity to sell flowers and I know there's even more that I have not even mentioned here. Um, so the reality of owning a business is that you're going to be a little scared. You don't have to have a big acreage. You don't have to have a tractor. You don't have to have a greenhouse. Um, you have to have some ambition, a little bit of bucks to buy some seed and some compost maybe and some fertilizer, maybe some flower netting, um, and some seed starting stuff if you don't already have it. And um, you really can do this. Um, and I will tell you that the number one, if you asked any business owner that's been in business, I'll say more than five years, what is your number one desire? And that's to have more time. Um, saving your time is the most precious thing that you can do. And learning from people that you can depend on um, that have actually done it. And I'm just saying this because there are so many voices out there and a lot of them are opinions and not experience based on doing it. Um, so there's, um, a lot of hunches and, um, not years of practical experience. So I'm just putting that out there because I've spoken to the people that have gone down the wrong road, kind of used up their ambition, kind of wasted some money, kind of their family's like, you know, this is not really working out for you, right? Let's move on. Um, so I just really um, invite you to join us next week. I'm going to talk about sustaining, and that is how you survive once you get started to make money and to live with what you're doing because y'all if you can't live the flower farm in life what's the point you have to enjoy it yeah it's hot yeah it's hard yeah it's a lot of work but 
you can master it depending on the market that you choose. See, that's why I got out of farmer's markets and we never did events. I wanted to be a Monday through Friday farmer. Um, and those things are possible, but it's all in what you do and how you choose what your, your markets are. I'm also gonna pop the link on here when I get off, um, the link to the page on my blog that has last week's videos and it'll have all the resources um, that we're talking about. And I hope you guys will join me next week. And I hope some of this has encouraged you a little bit. Um, because I will tell you, if there was, there was no more unlikely suspect to become a flower farmer than me. Um, wasn't even barely a gardener, y'all, when it all happened. And I just fell in love and um, hit the ground running. So I really invite you to join with me and um, check out those four resources, Dave Dowling's Farm hacks are amazing. Um, and I will see you next week. And the Gardener's Workshop um, is bringing this series to you. So check us out. Ciao.